<laughs> yes, the leap year is the leap year buffet. You bring the holiday. Yeah, the potluck. Bring your holiday party food. Yes. Some of you bring in brats and fruit beer, and the others of you are bringing. Uh, so there'll be a sign up that starts next week. So leave here the 29th. We get it once every four years. So. Uh, Mark chapter 2. We talked uh, about this passage of scripture uh, last week. Uh, we introduced it and it's looking at all three of sh these short stories in a collective fashion. Um, and you guys did just an outstanding job catching the, the big overall picture of what took place in this passage and how Mark lays in these three stories. Now, uh, we're going to go back through it again and just kind of slow down and look mainly tonight at the 18 through 22. Just sort of talk through it. This is another one of those nights where tonight, um, uh, thank you for coming, The but the, the clear, obvious applications to this passage are clear and obvious. Like, this is not one where you're like, man, I really need... Pastor Andy to tell me what to do, how to understand this. There's no hidden knowledge. There's no secret aha moment at the end. This is just pretty basic Bible study, uh, pretty basic stuff. I would like to say thank you to all of you who helped Sunday night uh, when we did the passage in uh, Sunday night service. Uh, it, it went really, really well, didn't it? Yeah. And it was really fun. I mean, and, and it was fun, and the crowd <laughs> interacted well with it, and. I, I could hear several of you sharing in, in your own areas, and so thank you for your help. And uh, I just I thought it went really, really well, so it was good stuff. Francis, you want to get up and say hello to somebody? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but I'm up here talking, so it's okay. I'm listening. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, Mark chapter 2. Jesus uh, has uh, been teaching, he's been traveling, and uh, he just got in trouble uh, in the verses prior to this, and now he's in trouble again. And Mark chapter 2, verse 18 says, Now John's disciples and Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so as long as they have him with them. The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. So let's just stop for a second. We, the, these are so clear and so simple. I'm not dividing you up into tables to talk, make lists together because the lists are pretty simple and straightforward. So let's do it together. Verse, in verse number 18, who are the people that are in this story? Who's identified? Pharisees. John's disciples. Pharisees. 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 And Jesus. 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 Yeah, we had got. We don't. We don't. Let's just go specifically what's named in verse eighteen. Some people came and asked Jesus. Okay. So, a um, couple things here. We got some translation issues. If interesting, uh, this is New Living Translation. You may have another Bible version in front of you. Maybe a King James by Jesus. Read, read verse 18 in the NIV. Okay. <clears throat> now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Okay. Anybody got King James? I did. Yeah, read King James. Verse 18? Yep. And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees. Okay, so say that a little bit louder. And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees. Okay, you guys see the distinction? Yeah. The Pharisees' disciples. So there's there's... The modern translations say the Pharisees themselves. The older translations say what? Who was it? The disciples. The of disciples the of the Pharisees. And so, um, some people make a pretty big distinction about this and make a big argument and fight. Um, we're not. It's not a big argument, big fight. Uh, it's just sort of a rhythmic sort of way of writing. Uh, John had disciples. Pharisees were prevented from having disciples. They didn't have disciples like a traditional rabbi would have. But what they did have was a group of people who followed them around and tried to do what they did. You know what we call those? Disciples? Disciples. <laughs> so, uh, they, so they, but they were very careful with their nomenclature, and they wouldn't use that term. And there weren't, like, distinctions. So it's, it would be like saying uh, 
these people who follow them around or learning from them, they would still be in the category of Pharisees. Like they would still be called Pharisees, even though they were sort of the students or in the sort of the learning guild or the people who were being mentored. They were all Pharisees. And so a, it's just a way of referring to them. And so we don't make a big distinction. Some of you look at different Bible uh, translations. I don't want to confuse you. Uh, one of the things that's also inherent in this is that it, um, Mark says, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And then what does it say? Some people. <coughs> yeah. And so here's all, always the question when you find something like that. The question is what? What people? What people? So how does NIV translate that one, Tony? I don't remember off the top of my head. On what verse? Uh, it would be verse 19. 18. Or, 18. 18. Second sentence in 18. Um, some people came in. Some people. Jesus. How does King James do it? And they come. And they came. <laughs> so same, some people came in the modern translations. In the King James it says they came. Do you see the difference? Yeah, the modern so third person. The they came like would second. be who? The disciples. The, John's the disciples, disciples themselves. The Pharisees and then the modern translations, it would be what? Some third party. Some people. We don't know who, who these people are. It's the same people who make up gossip about you at work. Nobody knows who they are, but they exist. Mm -hmm. Some people are saying, yeah. your, your car is ugly. So who is that people? We don't know. Um, so obviously some sort of interpretations and some and I, either other passages have been brought insight and enlightenment to it. We think this is Mark, uh, the, the term is truncating. I don't, what's a better, shortening. Mark shortening the verses and the language and so he's just using short, quick statements. Most likely, most commentators believe it isn't just some random people who are asking, it's the people themselves who are fasting. They're, one, they're, they're trying, these, these mentorees, these people who are learning from John, people who are learning from the Pharisees, and now they're seeing the people who Jesus is learning from, and they're asking questions. So why, why do they not do this? Why did he do this? So we talked, Kathy taught a few weeks ago on fasting, I think in one of the classes, maybe not in this one, mm -hmm. uh, but we've talked quite a bit about fasting. Let, let's just make a list over on the side of your page real fast. Think about 90 seconds at your table. We're going to discuss, the, discuss fasting. Fasting, not today. This is the key word. No, I'm not talking about in our world. So in the, in the time of Jesus, in the biblical history, what sort of things were associated with fasting? Sort of talk amongst your table. Make a list. On your mark, get set, go. What's the Bible say about fasting? expected and assumed that everybody was doing it going to do it Jesus didn't say if you fast or anything like that he specifically said when you fast knowing that you're going to fast so. They keep fasted leading up to challenging events. All right. What's what you come up with? Fasting associated with what? Giving up food. Giving up food. It's a pretty good start. Pray, sacrifice, penance, penance, which is a good word to say. I'm sorry. I'm trying to make this right. Doing what I need to do to get forgiveness. 
So I would even add, add the word forgiveness to this. In those days, people looking homely. Mm -hmm. Jesus tells his followers, hey, don't try to look sad when you're fasting. You know, clean yourself up. Look, look presentable. Yeah. So what, if, if he says clean yourself up, they were doing homely. So the Bible sort of talks about that. What's sort of the biblical language the Bible uses for that? Sackcloth and ashes, which essentially sounds like really a bad day. I mean, like at the end of the day, what you're saying is you're taking your clothes off, and you're putting on the most rough burlap and wearing it in your body. You're taking the ashes out of the fire, pouring it all over yourself, and you're going and sitting in front of your house. Okay. What about the oil? Did they do oil on their head? Uh, not typically around fasting, but but as part of part of that sort of religious practice, it wouldn't be disassociated with religious practice. So here's a question that none of you know the answer to, so I'm going to ask it and then hold pause for a second and then give you the answer. When does the Bible, the law specifically, tell Jews to fast? I guess it doesn't. It only tells them one time. Jews were to fast one day a year. The Day of Atonement. According to Scripture in the Old Testament, good Jews fasted one day a year and are actually told at other times not to. Okay, Kara, just hold on. Okay, because then the other side of the coin here says, well, wait a minute. What about all these dudes with sackcloth and ashes, right? So where would that come from? The made-up rules they made. The made-up rules that they made. At the same time, some of you who are astute biblical theologians know, wait a minute. I know Isaiah talks about fasting. I know Joel talks about fasting. So, on the magic whiteboard up here that has now been cluttered with these ancient church windows uh, you've got to you have to you, we've got to grab hold of this idea about the Bible the Bible is not 100% the same all the way through it it represents thousands of years of the way they work so think about it this way do we do church our church practices, the way we connect with God worship, exactly the way the people first assembly did 100 years ago. Yeah. No. So in 100 years, we've changed. Can you imagine how much change took place in Jewish practice in the 2,500 years and whole time periods where the law was gone and hidden or where there was no temple or they were in exile? You see what I'm saying? And so there was no passing on generation to generation to generation to do it. At the same time, it was like a really big epic game of religious telephone. So your grandfather did it this way and taught your dad how to do it this way. And your dad taught you how to do it this way. And you tell your son how to do this. And if great granddad and son got together, they might have two different ways of how you're supposed to do this. And so during the law period, this is the period of Moses, this is the period following it where we're close to it. You have a certain ways of practice. Then when you get to uh, future, when you have the king and the temple and those things are built, you have certain ways of practicing your faith. When the temple is destroyed, you get to another period. We call, let's just call it the period of the prophets because it's such a massive, we could get bogged down in it. And the prophets, they have a different set of times. So prophets talk about fasting. And so if there's only one day a year that you're supposed to fast according to the law, that's all that's required. And yet Jews are taught by the religious, religious leaders. Zechariah talks about the seven other fasts that take place. And he doesn't even tell you what they are. He just says our people are doing it. And so... Um, um, so let me read for you some of the extra, like not found in the Bible fasts that he's referring to. Uh, and let me and listen closely to how they're described and what they're fasting for. Okay. In the fourth month, 
Um, there is a fast on the 17th of the fourth month, and it's to commemorate the breaking of the tables or the tablets of the law. You fast to remember the day that Moses broke the Ten Commandments. Okay? <laughs> Secondly, on the ninth day of the fifth month, you fast to commemorate the destruction of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar. On the third of the seventh month, you fasted to remember the murder of Gedel Gedaliah, who was found in 2 Kings. He was a religious leader. So you're fasting to remember his murder. On the tenth month, day of the tenth month, you fasted to remember the siege and the taking of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Why do you fast? <laughs> to remember what? Bad stuff. Bad stuff. <laughs> And not just bad stuff. This isn't like you missed the sale at Dillard's on the New Year's Day bad stuff. This isn't like bad stuff your car wouldn't start. This was the breaking of the Ten Commandments, the destruction of the temple, the murder of one of those key spiritual leaders, and the taking of Jerusalem by the Babylon. By Babylon. By Babylonian. By blah, 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 blah. Anyway. <laughs> These are sorrow-filled or things that were destructive to your faith. The, the other side of it, then there becomes special call fasts. When, when prophets or other leaders said, we've got to fast. May I remember Joel, book of Joel? May I remember what was happening during that time? What was, does anybody remember what was, about, what was taking place? So those of you here in the 80s, you sang about it, and it was fun. Everybody clapped, and it was weird. <laughs> They're about to be destroyed by what? They run on the city, they rush on the wall. Great is the army that carries out his word. And I, this is Joel, and they're singing about what? Locusts. Which is hilarious that we sang this in church over and over and over again. They rush on the city. We're singing about the invading locusts that are about to eat your. Will was laughing. Is Will the only one who was with me when we were singing that? You remember that song? We're singing about bugs invading our church. Hallelujah. Nobody had any idea. We worshiped, we sang, we danced Jewish life. And so it was great. Blow the trumpet of Zion. Blow the trumpet of Zion. This is the whole thing. Sound the alarm. Why would you blow a trumpet in Zion? Why would you sound the alarm? Because the locusts are climbing the walls, and what's going to happen? We're going to get eaten. <laughs> okay, so we called a fast because we were about to be destroyed. They wrote a song about it. And they wrote a song about it in 1974. It was a good year. So why would okay? Forget all the humor for a moment. Why would why would Joel the prophet say before they come and get you fast? What's the hope? That God would see what's going on. What did you, what did you say in the back? They have less to eat. They have less to eat. So yeah, it's like we're going we're to fast because we don't. We, the, the locusts have eaten our food. So um, uh, you're fasting. God help us. Um, we're fasting because we're trying to get God's attention. We're trying to sig signify that. We're sorrowful. We are repentant. We're not just saying, God, I'm sorry I've sinned for hundreds and hundreds of years. Would you please save us? Then we're taking to the actions of humiliating ourselves and of, of what you might even call harming ourselves to prove to you and to show you that we're dependent on you and our, our, ourselves and you need to come to our rescue. Interesting enough, it didn't work in Joel. They still continue to come. Um, so fasting ties it all that stuff together. On top of that, Pharisees, they show up. So we've got how many days are Jews supposed to fast according to the law? One. One. We know they've added several more to prove they're sorrowful and they're trying to, to make it right, the breaking of the Ten Commandments. I mean, just even me saying it out loud, the breaking of the Ten Commandments. That's bad. And it has to do with what? How you live and how you act. The destruction of the temple. <coughs> how you connect with God. So this is about holiness and integrity. This is about religious practice and how you worship. Um, all these components. 
On top of that, Pharisees decided that wasn't enough. So they added two days a week that they fasted. A good Pharisee fasted on Monday and Thursday. And this was kind of like the deal. Like, if you want your Pharisee card, you got to pay the dues and you got to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. And uh, the fact that we know that they fast on Mondays and Thursdays 2,000 years later tells us what about the time that they were fasting? They kept records and they let people know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Does this remind you of any of other Jesus' teachings on fasting? What not to do? Wash your face. Wash your face. <laughs> and so it would be something like this. We'd all be Pharisees. So Sunday, we would eat big. Okay? We throw, and this is when we have people over at our house. This is when we have parties. This is when things would be good. It'd be great. And we're happy. And then on Monday, we'd be fasting and we would be hangry. We would be angry and hungry all at the same time. And what we would do is we would be in our spiritual practice to show God how much we loved him and how spiritual we were. We were jerks to everyone around us and we looked at it, wanted everyone to say, look at me. It's Monday. Don't, don't talk to me on Monday. Great. This is Monday. <laughs> I don't care about your kid's birthday party. It's Monday. I can't come to that day. I, I can't eat. And I live out my spirituality in front of you. And so uh, a couple things are taking place here. John the Baptist, um, he comes. And what's basically John the Baptist's role in the Bible? We've talked about it a little bit. He does what for Jesus? He's the hype man. He's the hype man. He sets him up. What is John the Baptist's main preaching message? Repent. I'm not the one, but what's his main preaching message? Repent, Repent and be baptized. If you're if you're preaching repentance and baptism, what is John making? If he, if if I'm up here saying you people need to repent, what does John, what am I thinking about you? That you're sinners. That you're sinners. And so John's deal is ask for forgiveness and make it right, in the hopes that. The second part of the message, which you just said, is what? There's one coming after me, and what will he actually do? Save his people from He'll their save you and forgive you. So get his attention, repent, and he will save you. Does this sound like anything we've just been talking about? Old Testament prophetic fasting. <laughs> Which is John the Baptist, if you had to give him a category, what would we call him? He'd probably most like a prophet. So John's disciples are taught to fast because they want to get God's attention so that they can have forgiveness. The Pharisees, on the other hand, they, they fast on Mondays and they fast on Thursdays. And they fast on the Day of Atonement. And they fast on those other fasting days. Why would they do those things? Show off. But let's give them a break a little bit. Let's just say they start. Maybe they do it for show off purposes. But what's their sort of motivation with everything they do? It's what you're supposed to do. It's what you're supposed to do. It's beyond what you're supposed to do. It's beyond what you're supposed to do with the purposes of what? What is, what is supposed to do get you? Making sure you follow the law. Points problems. with God. And to be... And to live what kind of life? Holy. A holy life. They're trying to be like God. And I think a good word that we don't use much around here is called piety. A life that reflects the purity and the integrity of serving God. And a Pharisee has piety, has the way to live, is done by keeping rules. And so you know how holy you are. Because you've got more rules kept than others. And they've added rules on top of rules. So how many days are you supposed to fast a year? One. One. And they've added out two days a week. We're way better than the rest of you. And so they're taught to do this. And then Jesus shows up. 
with a bunch of Galilean fishermen and hillbillies. <laughs> Uneducated rabble, minus the few tax collectors and those people who those people aren't even respected and looked up to then at all. And it comes along and it says this. Now, can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot. So as long as they have him with them, but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. So, very poetic, lots of language. Let me kind of break it down in explanation. So a bridegroom is only really uh, involved in what? A wedding. And uh, unlike today, where today the groom is worthless in most American weddings. Mm. He is simply a figure on the stage to say yes. Okay? In our context and culture, weddings are about who? The bride. The bride. Okay? Counsel everybody when they sit down and do the wedding and do premarital counseling. You have opinions, sir, and you have thoughts. And God doesn't care about your opinions and thoughts right now. <laughs> just, the answer is not just yes, over and over and over again, but you say, I'm not sure, babe, what do you think would be best? Like, That's the answer that you have to every question. And I think you're right, is, is the way you say it. I've thought about it, and you're right. That's the way it works. But in Jewish culture, completely different. The bridegroom is a big part of it. And you've heard the parable of the ten virgins. You've heard stories about it. But Jewish weddings are multi-day events. In fact, you're not allowed to get married around the, the, the big feast or fasting days because it's prohibited in the, to fast during the wedding. Because what is a wedding if it's not anything but a big, huge party with eating all the time? And you don't know when the groom is going to show up, but when he shows up, you better go. And when the groom shows up, then everybody for seven days, it's a, it is a festival, it is a big deal. And if you think about it for just a second, these are small, for the most part, villages. These are small communities. You have villages and towns that are only several hundred people at max. I'm not talking about Jerusalem. I'm not talking about the big cities, but most of Israel is small towns. You're not having weddings every day. It's a big thing. Everything shuts down. Everybody comes together. And to fast, um, but let's just, let's do it this way. So Rick's uh, son marries my daughter. Okay. And we're, we have, everyone comes this, you are all invited. And when we say you're invited to the wedding, that means you're invited for seven days. Like you're all here and it's up to us to feed and have the party and celebrate and food. And so much so that when Jesus' family has a wedding and they run out of drinks, it's it horribly is. insulting. Bad. We got to come up with something. So, just as it's bad if the host doesn't have enough food, can you imagine how insulted Rick and I would be if Drew showed up to the wedding and refused to eat? And we put things in front of him, and Drew's like, I'm sorry. I'm fasting. I'm not eating your stuff, because then I'm more holy than you are. And the groom is insulted because you're saying, I don't want to participate in your family life. I don't want to be a part of this the year and rest of your life. This is the beginning of us being in community together. And Jesus walks up and says, my disciples don't fast because they're not waiting on the bridegroom. He's here. And they're only going to have me for a little while. So, Pharisees, they fast. What was that word that began with P? I called. I said just a minute ago. Piety, for the purposes of trying to make things look right and trying to be holy and to do what's right. John the Baptist's disciples, why are they fasting? They want to get whose attention? God. God, for the purposes of what? Forgiveness. Do Jesus's disciples have to get God's attention? Nope. 
Because he's there. <laughs> In fact, to waste time trying to get his attention would miss the opportunity for his individual instruction. Okay? Same thing happens with the Pharisees' concept of piety. So I've got two minutes left. So let me land this plane and give you some, some walking away thought processes first. Um, just how do I, let me say it differently for time's sake. I think there's a tendency in all of us to want to go to great lengths to try to get God's attention with our actions. When we, as the body of Christ and the bride of Christ, have him side by our, by, right by our side. We go to elaborate things to get his attention for forgiveness and grace when all we have to say is, hey, Jesus. And the, John the Baptist's disciples were trying to bring in this moment, and it wasn't anything they could do. Uh, secondly, I think many times we fall into the same trap of Pharisees, especially when it comes to spiritual practice, and we say, if we can just, if I can create the right set of actions and equations to move God's hand, if I can do the right kinds of things, I can give the right amount of money, spend the right amount of time, read enough Bible verses, attend enough church enough times a week, not watch this thing, do this here. If I can get the right system of yeses and noes in my life together, then God will call me holy. I can just manipulate the systems. Missing, of course, the whole overall thing. That Jesus has invited us to relationship with him and his ever-present help in a time of trouble. His closer, he's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He's as close, and the song goes, as the mention of his name. Uh, he is not far from us. He is beside us. And we don't have to get his attention because he is shaking us to look at him. <laughs> and all the actions and the machinations and the stuff we come up with to somehow to make God happy and pleased are simply not as important as obedience. Because listen to this carefully. Make sure I say it right. This is what I think, not what I know, because I'm talking about extra biblical stuff. I think if you had Rainy the Pharisee and Drew the Pharisee, and we were standing side by side, and Rainy the Pharisee fasted one day a year, as the law said, but tried to please God with his whole heart, his whole mind, and a whole understanding, and in all his ways acknowledged him. And then you had Drew the Pharisee, who was trying to do all these other fasting things that weren't commanded. When we stood before God, people, Drew would say, look how many things I did right. And he only did it once, and I did it two days a week. I think Jesus would look and say, yes, but he did what I asked. And you were doing what you want to get my attention. Oh. You are in a competition with others to stand above them. And he, he is one who is in a place to receive grace through obedience. Competitive spirituality and spirituality for the sake of others' happiness Will ultimately lead you to forming your own Pharisee guild and your own group of people who compete with others to get God's attention when all the time Jesus says you don't need, I don't, you don't have to get my attention because I'm looking right at you. So why doesn't Jesus teach his disciples to fast? Well the first reason and we'll talk about the second one next week but the first reason is this, he was there he already had their attention. This week, don't fall into gimmicks to get God to do something for you. Fall in love with Jesus and watch what he does, what he needs to do. Have a great night. Mm -hmm.